of course, we're not just watching the mayoral race. We're going to be watching those ward races as well. And as I was mentioning, there are a few of them that are open because councillors, longtime councillors in some cases, have decided not to run again. Denzel Min and Wong is among them from Don Valley East, first becoming a councillor in 1994. My goodness, then one of Tory's deputy uh, mayors for the past eight years. Thank you, Denzel, for being here tonight. Pleasure. I guess the first thing I'm kind of curious about is everybody has their own reason. Sometimes they're on to go on to a different level of politics, but I'm just kind of curious. When we see so many people leaving council, leaving that job, why do you think that is? I think that we all have our, our reasons and all of them are different. Um, so uh, I, I think some, some councillors uh, just want to move on and do different things. Mm -hmm. That would be part of my decision. Mine, I have a lot of reasons. I, you found, I found out during COVID how much time I was spending away from my family. Right. Uh, because I was spending so much time with my family, that was a factor as well. Um, uh, others are seeking other career opportunities, so it's a whole mixed bag. One thing that I've heard from several councillors and residents, voters as well, is just how slow things often move at council and that that is a chief driver of frustration for them. I'm curious, from what you've seen at council over your long time there, is that a frustration that you've dealt with, the fact that things are just so slow sometimes to go through? Government is generally slow, so you have to have a certain level of patience. You also have to understand that, you know, there are a lot of people who are impatient, but things like community consultation take time. You, get, you know, the planning process takes some time. You can't, you can't circumvent involvement from the community and also if you're developing a community, you just don't do it overnight like that. Right. Um, you have to, there's a lot of minutia that has to be discussed. I understand the impatience for sure, but uh, you know, they say that civic government is closest to the people. That's because we deal with detail. Can we do better? 100%. But uh, you know, things take time at City Hall. We just heard from Nama, who was talking about how with the planning in particular around City Hall, there are so many times where there are resident objections that are standing in the way of smart ideas, good ideas from what she was saying. How often do you see that, where there's this kind of NIMBY crowd that's jumping in and saying they don't want something, and that slows down a project? Sometimes there are residents' ob objections that are, that are standing in the way of bad development. I've always come and started from the place where you go to the community, you ask their views, you give them the benefit of the doubt. Some of these folks come in from somewhere outside the community and they tell the community what they think they know best. Mm -hmm. And that's the wrong approach. One of the things the city needs to, I think, take a better look at is uh, having authentic consultation. We've lost that. We want to rush, rush, rush. We don't want to talk. We want to rubber stamp things and ram them through. That's not how civic government worked in the past, ever since I was on council, and I think we need to revisit it and balance out good ideas and also bad ones. One of the things that came up a lot on this campaign trail was the state of disrepair of mm -hmm. the city of Toronto. You were recently telling the Toronto Star that there's a feeling that the city doesn't care anymore due to what you called neglect. Describe for me why you feel like we're seeing this kind of decay. Well, um, I think because for a long time we haven't been investing in, in the infrastructure. Um, uh, and uh, in some places we've been cutting back. Um, be, um, how, and we haven't been looking at efficiencies. If we looked at efficiencies in the government, we, we would have, and I'm not talking about cuts, mm -hmm. two different things. We could find the money to fund more of these programs. The other thing that I think that, that people don't realize is we've been putting our eggs in specific baskets. So we've been putting them in housing and transit, which are worthwhile priorities. But when you put all your eggs in one basket, it means you're not, you're not balancing out. Like we need to spend more money on roads. We need to spend more money on fixing up our public right of ways in our parks. When you put all your money over to these things, it's a choice. It means you're not spending as much money on these other things. And, and uh, we've got to rebalance and look at those things. 
You started off that answer by talking about the revenue uh, that the city is bringing in. And some argue that the reason why we're seeing this neglect is because property taxes are low in Toronto, the lowest in Ontario. How much responsibility do you and other councillors who have supported keeping property taxes low, how much responsibility do you share in then having this kind of urban decay and lack of uh, services? Sure. Um, I, again, I'll go back to this idea that the, this city council has been kicking down, down, kicking the can down the road in terms of looking at finding efficiencies. And uh, that's, I think that's been a funding problem. We have other really challenging funding problems and we have a, uh, the economy that we have to deal with. Um, but we've got a shortfall in the land transfer tax coming up because real estate mm -hmm. is not transacting as much as we thought. I think, I think the province was down 15% in their land transfer tax. For us, that works out to $150 million. We've got some other costs coming. So for example, you know, the Eglinton Crosstown, the province paid for the capital, the operating costs are ours. So we're gonna have to pay for the operating costs and you know that we don't, we don't make all that money from the fare box, so it's, we're going to be short there. If we were to just spend the resources on fare evasion, these are people that are stealing from the TTC, we would get $70 million. But because some members of council don't want to do that, they want to actually make transit free, that $70 million could go a long way to fixing up the city. And that's $70 million every single year. Contracting out garbage, we just made that decision. $14 million that we lost. That, how many uh, splash pads could we build for $14 million? These are decisions that are being made and we have to understand the true impact of them. Okay, um, now the other thing that of course a lot of people have been talking about throughout this campaign is the strong mayor powers that the next mayor of the city of Toronto is going to have. What do you think that's gonna do to the dynamics at uh, City Hall, you support them? I do support uh, the strong mayor uh, uh, powers. He, uh, John Tory, if he gets elected tonight, will be the only person that was elected by all the people. And so he should, he should have uh, those extra powers. And uh, I think there's a, my fear is that if some of the races go as they might, that this will be more of a left-wing council and we need, fisc we need folks, councillors, representatives, representatives that uh, are going to look at the finances and I'm afraid that they're not going to want to. And so the mayor is going to have to be there to use those powers. And I would say that my guess is John Tory, uh, if he's elected tonight, which I hope that he is, will be very careful in how he uses that power uh, because I think he's been very careful over the last eight years in terms of getting along with his colleagues. So you're supportive of this idea, these strong mayor powers, given the fact that you're thinking about it in reference to John Tory potentially getting reelected tonight. But what if somebody from the left wing of the city's political scene, a Josh Matlow or a, uh, you know, Michael Layton, what if one of them are in the mayor's chair? Do you still support strong mayor powers then? 100%. Uh, I do because it allows the voters to, it, uh, it makes the mayor, purely accountable for his mandate. He can't blame anybody else. People know uh, when that person runs for re-election, they'll be held accountable. You can't say, oh no, that was council's decision. That wasn't my responsibility. Right. That person is in the hot seat for what he did. Okay, and then finally, just before I let you go, I know that Councillor Cynthia Lai was a, a good friend of yours. I saw your tweet after she passed away on Friday. What would you like to say about the legacy that she leaves council and this city? Cynthia Lai was, was a really wonderful counselor. Uh, she was a, a real estate agent. Uh, uh, she was very involved in the Chinese community. Um, and uh, her legacy is one of, I think, hopefulness, um, of happiness. On, on social media, everyone had such nice things to say about her. And they were all, she has such happy pictures. And it's about how someone can work with her community. And she was very proud of her community to accomplish uh, good and great things. Very positive. All right, great. Well, thank you for those kind words and thank you for joining us today. My pleasure.